in all my books, there is a sense of, of trying to see the world, not, not with your eyes only, to sense the world. History repeats itself. The horror things happen over and over. And it is not less painful for a mother in El Salvador than it was for Samuel's mother in Vienna. In Vienna. It is the same pain. I have had to move many times in my life as the daughter of diplomats, as, as a political refugee, as an immigrant, and I have traveled extensively. So I'm always moving around and starting again. And that makes me very aware of a sense of place. And the sense of place I have is within me. It's in my books, it's in my memory, it's in the people I love. It is women who can change the world. They change the family, they change the community. 40,000 American lawyers represent immigrant children pro bono in the courts. 99% are women because there's no glory and no money in it. Das ist der Podcast Dichtung und Wahrheit. Ich bin Silke Hohmann. Wir sprechen hier mit Autorinnen und Autoren von Surkamp und Insel über ihre Dichtung und über ihre Wahrheit. Guten Tag. Heute moderiere ich eine ganz besondere Podcast-Folge an. Die Kulturjournalistin Christiane von Korf hat die Bestseller-Autorin Isabel Allende in ihrem Haus in Kalifornien getroffen und dort mit ihr über ihr umfangreiches Werk gesprochen. Christiane von Korf hat schon viele Gespräche mit der Autorin geführt und mittlerweile verbindet die beiden eine ganz besondere freundschaftliche Nähe. Es ist ein sehr persönliches Gespräch entstanden, in dem Allende über ihre eigene Flucht als Migrantin von Chile nach Venezuela und in die USA spricht. Allende erzählt, was das Exil aus ihr gemacht hat und erklärt, warum es letztlich die Erfahrungen aus ihrer eigenen Flucht waren, die aus ihr eine Schriftstellerin haben werden lassen. Außerdem tauchen die beiden tief in die Geschichten der Feministin Isabel Allende ein. Die Schriftstellerin erzählt von ihrer Stiftung, die sie gegründet hat, um damit illegale und legale Geflüchtete zu unterstützen. Aber genug der Vorrede, jetzt gebe ich ab an Christiane von Korf und Isabel Allende. Das Gespräch haben die beiden auf Englisch geführt. Ich wünsche euch viel Vergnügen bei dieser Folge Dichtung und Wahrheit. I'm happy to meet Isabel Allende at her home in California. A warm welcome, Isabel, and thank you for your invitation. Oh, it's so wonderful to see you again, Christiane. So wonderful. <laughs> I haven't seen you like in three or four years. Yes. It's a long time. A long time. Isabel, your debut, The House of the Spirits, turned you into a world-famous author. Your novels are translated into more than 40 languages and have a circulation of around 73 millions. Actually, it's 77, Christian. 77, <laughs> my now. And this is two years ago. <laughs> wow. You have been recognized with many prestigious awards. Until now, you have been written 27 books. Or? Yes. Your latest novel, The Wind Knows My Name, Der Wind kennt meinen Namen in German, is a compelling story about escape and immigration. It follows two children who are trapped by violence and left to navigate immigration by themselves. Isabel, you yourself had to endure immigration after Salvador Allende, your father's cousin and president of Chile, was murdered at a military coup in 1973. You fled Chile 15 months later with your husband and two children. Tell me about the moment when you decided to leave your country. It took me a very long time to make that decision. It's very hard to leave everything that you love, everything that is familiar to you. Uh, and really, I didn't think it would be for too long. I thought I would just get out of Chile for a while and then we will have democracy again and I will be able to come back. So I left alone first, and uh, I was living in Venezuela as a refugee for a month or so when my husband decided that it was not safe for me to return. I could just close the house with everything it contained and came with the children to Venezuela. We never thought that we would spend there so many years. I lived there 
13 years before I immigrated to the United States. And just to explain to our listeners, you were on the blacklist. You had to leave your country. You were threatened. Many people in the situation I was knew what was going on. I was a journalist. So there was, we had more information than most people. So very, very quickly, we learned about people that disappeared, about torture centers that sometimes were in your same neighborhood, and, and the different forms of, of repression that, that the country was enduring. So uh, I was compelled to help some people because I was asked. And at the beginning, I didn't know the risk, really, because we had never experienced anything like that in Chile. Yeah. So I started hiding people in my house and getting people out through different embassies, trying to find asylum in embassies. And coming to exile, in exile, your life completely changed. In Chile, you were a well-known journalist. You had your own column in the feminist magazine Paula. In Venezuela, you had to start your life from scratch. What was the most important change and challenge for you in exile? I think one thing was poverty. That uh, at the beginning it was very hard. We, we didn't have any money. Then my my husband found a job, but he had to give half of his salary to a Venezuelan person so that he could sign the do the the documents or whatever it was. So we we lived with little money, but also with no connections. And I come from a continent, from a place where. It's all about family, clan, tribe. You, you belong in a community. And you, be, you, you get your name by the connections you have, not really by your bio. So in, in Venezuela, whatever I had done in Chile was meaningless and useless. If I had had connections, I could have found a job, not, not because I had a good curriculum. But you found a job in the end. You were Many years later. Uh, many years later. Yes. You found a job as a teacher, right? I was administering a school. And you once told me as well that life in Venezuela was very different from your life in Chile because the people are so... Expansive. <laughs> yeah. and, and happy, you know. Venezuela is a tropical country where people have a sense of music and, and enjoyment, partying. Any excuse was good for a party. Very different from Chile, which is a much sober country. It was, at the time, even more so, because it was living under a regime of terror. So life there also enriched you? Yes. My experience in Venezuela gave me a sense of um, joy that I didn't have before. Before, my, my life was mostly about drama <laughs> and tragedy. And that doesn't, doesn't go in Venezuela. I mean... Drama, who wants drama? You want to be to have a good time. So I learned to have a good time. And there's something about the senses, about color and heat and, and the beauty of, of, of people. You know, you go to the beach in Venezuela and you see the most beautiful women in the world. They are all beauty queens and, and they show their body with no modesty at all. And men the same. In Chile, if you have breasts, you wear a starched blouse. In Venezuela, you put them out there. <laughs> <laughs> so this means being in exile had also a positive impact. Oh, absolutely. I don't think I would be a writer without the Venezuelan experience. You tell me what I would have asked you the next. <laughs> the next was, um, in Caracas, you started writing letters to your grandfather. From this emerged the House of the Spirits, a saga of a Latin American family from the 1920s to the 70s, which is based on your own family story. Did exile move you from nonfiction to creating fiction? Yes. In Venezuela, when I started this letter for my grandfather, I knew after a page that it wasn't a letter like all the other letters, and he would probably never read it. And it was much more than that. It was like an exercise in nostalgia, 
trying to recover the world I had lost, to put in paper the people that I would probably never see again, the, my country, my language, my traditions, the stories of my family, everything was in there. And um, I would not have done that without the need to recover what I had lost. And I don't think that the book would have had the tone it has if I had written it in Chile, because I could have written that book after the military coup when I was living in Chile, but yes. it would not be at all the same book. I wrote that book many years later in the, in the color of Venezuela, which allowed me to, to in, introduce in the book a sense of, uh, of sensuality, of, uh, of color, of magic that, that was very much Venezuela. Ah, and you are talking about the tone and this, therefore you have found this tone, this particular tone for your book? And I think that that tone has remained with me. In, well, in all my books there is a sense of, of trying to see the world, not, not with your eyes only, to sense the world to sense the world with all your being. You want texture, you want smells, you want um, sounds. All that is important mm -hmm. when I describe a scene or when I think of a story. And uh, also the magical realism. Which is very Latin American, but it's not only Latin American, Christiana. You find that, I live in the United States for many years in, in books written by, by African-Americans, by um, Asian people who live in the United States, by Chicanos that have been born in the United States and have, they don't even speak Spanish anymore, but they still have that sense of, of, of the, the mystery of the world. I just uh, make a little jump to the point that you never returned to your homeland, Chile, and in 1988, you immigrated again to another country, to the U.S., to California. And this is a quite different culture. <laughs> so how did this come, that you immigrated again? And how did you adapt to the American culture, if you adapted? <laughs> well, in 1987, I was on a book tour in the United States, and I met Willie Gordon who was a lawyer in California. We fell in love. Well, I fell in love. I don't <laughs> know if he did. I can't prove that. And I moved to his house without an invitation, with the idea that I would spend a week with him and take him out of my system. But we ended up getting married, and I lived with him for 28 years. And because we got married, I became a citizen, and I could bring my children to the United States. So by the time that... Um, we had democracy again in Chile, and I could have returned to my country. I was living here in, in California. I was married. I have a family. I, I had a, a life here. So I was always like postponing the possible return. But I, for as long as I was married with Willie, it didn't come up. I was, he was not going to emigrate with me to another country. And then when we divorced, it was really too late. I was by then 74 yeah. years old. But you tell, you tell me now that uh, because you were married to Willie, that you didn't, uh, this was one reason not to, to go back to Chile. To live in Chile. To I, live in Chile. I went many times. Yes. I would, go, I would go several times a year because mm -hmm. my, by then my parents had moved, had moved to Chile and I would see them often. I would like to know more about your experiences as a migrant in the US. So as a child and young woman in Chile, you belonged to the upper middle class and were considered white. And you once told me that you realized for the first time in the US that you were considered not white. Yeah, I was uh, here I'm a person of color and I'm very proud of it. I keep saying, repeating it. <laughs> But what is your insight of society from this experience that they, you weren't considered not wise? Well, to, to, for me, it was a badge of honor. But mm. for my mother, for example, when I told my mother, my mother was very racist. <laughs> This was a shock. <laughs> This was a terrible shock. But, you know, when, when you go to another country to start a life as an immigrant, you have to reinvent yourself. 
uh, you are no longer the person you were in your own country. And when you go back to your country, you realize that that's not your can the country you left. Everything has changed. People have changed. The country has changed. And you have changed. So the, the, you, you don't belong really anywhere. So how did you reinvent yourself? In which way? First of all, I had to learn the language to be able to work and live in English was a challenge. Uh, then to start a life with a man that I knew very little of and who had a very messy, dysfunctional family and a dysfunctional life. So that was also another challenge. And I didn't like the United States. Although I live in California, which is the most progressive state in, 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 the, in this country. And um, it took me years doing tours and traveling in the United States to realize that the foreign policy of this country is not what most people are or believe in. One thing is the foreign policy and one thing is the American people. Most people here are generous and kind. And uh, the, 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 the country right now is completely polarized. There is a lot of violence and people hate each other. But it was not like that when I came. How was it when you came? When I came, there was not this uh, extreme political polarization. Mm -hmm. this, this, there was, there's always been a very conservative country, socially conservative. But, but not like today that we have this MAGA thing and we have the, the Christian nationalists, which are really Nazi parties. Right. We will come back later to this in our conversation. Um, I just would like to focus again on um, coming to the United States, adapting to the culture, to society. And you once told me, I'm a stranger as a migrant in the US and I became a stranger in Chile. Mm -hmm. Are you a stranger everywhere? Where are you at home, would be my question then. I, I am what Pablo Neruda would call a displaced person. Uh, someone who doesn't... Who, I have had to move many times in my life as the daughter of diplomats, as, as a political refugee, as an immigrant, and I have traveled extensively. So I'm always moving around and starting again. And that makes me uh, very aware a sense of place. And the sense of place I have is within me. It's in my books, it's in my memory, it's in the people I love, but not anymore in a, in a land, in a geographical place. I think I could live almost anywhere. Mm -hmm. So this means you find also, do you create your own home in your, or your own country? I mean, I just in your novels, for example, comes into my mind, you wrote the memoir, My Invented Country, Mein Erfundenes Land in German. It was published in Germany in 2003. It is a personal memoir of exile and homeland and a declaration of love to Chile. And did you create your own country? That, that book is called My Invented Country because that is the country I remember and the country I have cherished in my heart. So I keep it intact, but it doesn't exist anymore. That, that is the country of my childhood, which does not exist. Everything has changed, I think, for the better. Um, Chile is a better country now than it was then. Then there was a lot of poverty and things were much harder for most people. Uh, however, what, what you keep as the memories of childhood is really what gives you the foundation of who you will become in life. Mm -hmm. And that foundation for me is very strong. It's my grandfather, my grandparents' house, my, my extended family. That Chile from them is, as I said, doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> But you reinvented it. I invented in my in, in the book, yeah. I invented in my heart. Yes. And when I go back, I'm always expecting to find it. And when I go to the south of Chile, to the deep south, 
to villages in the south, I still find some of it. And, and people have not changed that much. So, I mean, you have a wide range of novels, also novels who take place in, in California. So I would like to ask you a general question. What does writing mean to you? Writing, first of all, I am used to put everything in writing. What I don't write didn't happen. I forget it immediately. And so now I have the problem that for oh, during all my life, I have written to my mother every single day. And, uh, and she has written to me. She, but now my mom is dead and I have nowhere, no one to, to write daily as I did to her. So what happens is that Now, if I want to know what happened, let's say the 17th of July of 1990, mm -hmm. I go to the garage, take out the box, open the, the mm -hmm. box, and inside, you know, in chronological order, yeah. is every single day of the year. Yeah, it's very impressive. I once yeah. saw it in the garage. With, yeah. with the emotion of the day. So memory is very, very capricious. It changes everything in time. Mm -hmm. And so what I remember now It's not even similar to what really happened because you change it in your mind. And I go to the letters and I see what really happened and I see how much I have forgotten and how much I have changed. To give you an example, I just I was reading letters from 2016, not that long ago, if you think about it. It's only six years, seven years ago uh, when I divorced Willie. I went out with a few men, but nothing serious. And I tell my mother in, for three months mm -hmm. that I go out in a boat, sailing in a boat. I go to the mm -hmm. woods. I go with this guy. I can't for my life remember who the guy was. <laughs> I don't remember the name. I don't remember the guy. I don't remember anything. So I Googled him. And there are 15 people with the same name because it's a very common American yeah. name. <laughs> and so I eliminated the young and I eliminated the old and the dead. Mm -hmm. And I'm left with eight and I have no idea who they are. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of how important the daily letter was for me. It was the, a recording of existence that now I don't have. So now the, the days blur into each other. Mm -hmm. they, they, they sort of disappear into nothingness. And as I remember, you used the letters as well to create novels, to write novels. I mean, the, the, yes. Paula, the book Paula, for example. That was letters that my mother and I exchanged yes. during the time Paula was ill. Mm -hmm. um, but if I, if I write a memoir, which I have written Paula, the sum of our days, I just pick up the letters and there's everything <laughs> there, you know. It's wonderful. And I don't have it anymore. But it's a fun story which you told us that you even didn't remember this guy you were <laughs> dating after you divorced. Well, well really. I didn't sleep with him. So okay. because in that case, I think I would have I would have remembered. <laughs> I think I'm not sure. So uh, tell us, please, uh, when you were over 70, you divorced your second husband, Willie, and you fell in love again. And but married. Much, but, la but later. Isn't it? Later in later. life. So my question <laughs> is, tell me about this particular love and what is different about falling in love late in life? When you fall in love late in life, you know that you don't have time. So there is a sense of urgency. You cannot waste one day. Everything needs to happen now because we don't know about tomorrow. And uh, every day I ask Roger, if this was a good day, if this was a perfect day, because we cannot afford to have a bad day or, or, or we cannot afford little fights or little stupid games that couples play. Uh, there's a sense that you have to preserve this that, that will not last. That gives a certain intensity to the relationship that I think is fascinating in a way. Uh, On the other hand, we come to a relationship late with a lot of baggage, a life that you have lived, relationships and connections and things that you've done that weigh in your life and that affects the relationship. But, but also, you are falling apart together. Slowly but surely, you are getting older and, and 
weaker and your health starts to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. And so you will have to live with that person through that end of life, which is never lovely. It's most of the time painful and ugly. Mm -hmm. So that is something that we have to prepare for. And you also marry uh, the family of, uh, of yeah. your husband and your husband marries your That's grandchildren. So, that is also very important. Because I was lucky that his children accepted me because they adored their wonderful mother. Grace was a wonderful woman. And the, Roger was married to her for 48 years. So he was devastated when she died. And his children, who adored their mother, I, I'm sure that they had difficulty in accepting someone who would come not to replace her, because I would never replace her, but, but to occupy that part of their father's life. And your grandchildren and your son uh, oh, accepted? They, Nico and Lori have been incredibly wonderful to Roger. And I think they are very happy because I have someone, I'm, someone with me, otherwise I would be bothering him. They would, they, I would make their lives impossible. Yeah, and um, I don't want to be impolite, but elder women complain that men wouldn't be interested in her. So um, I never thought I, that. No. No, I think that... I, I, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but when I divorced Willie, everybody said, well, you are 74 years old. Are you crazy? I mean, you will spend the rest of your life alone. But for me, that was not a problem at all. The idea that I would be alone was not a problem. I was prepared to be alone much better than to be in a bad relationship. But then out of the woodwork, men showed up. So it's not that I, that, that, that I was, I had lots of, of suitors, no, <laughs> but just enough. So that I never felt really, really alone. And I never thought I would remarry. And I would have not married Roger, except for the fact that for him, it was really important. Why? He, I have no idea, but for him, for, he met me, and three days later, when he was taking me to the airport, he proposed and he said, let's get married. He already had a ring. And I said, are you crazy? Why are we going to get married? We are not going to start a family, so <laughs> forget <laughs> it. You can be my lover, but you have to come to California. <laughs> This and was your did. condition. <laughs> yeah, so he would come to California for the weekend several times a year, and it was very stressful. And I would not move to New York by any means. Mm. So at one point, he, he asked his son, he said, I'm, I'm thinking of just dropping everything and move to California with this woman. And Anthony said, Dad, what do you have to lose? Just take the risk. Yeah. And so he sold his house, gave away everything it contained, and moved to my house with two bikes, some clothes that I promptly discarded because they were dated, And um, some crystal glasses for some reason. Maybe he thought I didn't have glasses. Yeah. <laughs> That was it. And then when he was unpacking, I remember, uh, when he came and he was unpacking his stuff, he said, you know, this better work. Because if it doesn't, I will be homeless. And I never thought of it that it's true. He would be ho homeless. I had nothing to lose. He had everything to lose. <laughs> Yeah, but you say to him, this is my condition, you have to move, you would never have... Oh, no, no, it was an out moved. of the question that I would yeah. live in New York. And I'm surprised that he proposed to you because normally you uh, take the initiative. No, I, the initiative I took was that when we met, he had been writing to me for six months, every morning and every evening, and I have never seen him. So when I went to New York, we met, and he invited me out for lunch. And at lunchtime I said, What are your intentions? Because I'm 74 years old, I have no time to waste. He almost flipped. I mean, he, he <laughs> choked on the ravioli, the poor man. But, but he didn't panic. And, and then he said that his intentions were completely serious. I mean, he had just met me. He had seen me for 10 minutes before. <laughs> and I was already putting him against the wall, you know? Yeah. What do you want? <laughs> so Isabel, you are a strong woman. I may say, and in all your novels, women are rebellious. 
And you yourself have been a feminist since you were a young woman. A couple of years ago, you wrote the book The Soul of a Woman, in German, Was wir Frauen wollen. It is a feminist plea. What does it mean to you to be a feminist today? The same that it meant when I was 14. It means that we have to replace this world in which we live for another form of civilization. We have to replace the patriarchy. Women have been suffering from this patriarchy for thousands of years. And it doesn't have to be that way. But it will take much, a much longer struggle than I thought when I started. What we have achieved is, a, is great, but we still have so much more to do. So I now have the same passion about it and the same um, anger that I had when I was a young woman. What makes you angry? The fact that things have not changed fast enough. Yeah, okay. and, and they have only changed for certain women. M many, many for women. Example. Were, for example, today women in Afghanistan uh, who were lawyers and, and, and doctors and teachers, and were, they, they are back in a burqa inside their homes and they can't even get out. Now in the United States, Uh, rights that women have had for decades have been taken away, that the right for abortion, to plan your own family, and now they are planning to take away contraception also. So the idea is to have women poor and pregnant at home, mm. because that's safer for the patriarchy, mm. and we have to struggle against that. Mm. 80% of refugees in the world are women and children, according to uh, Uh, Refuge Point, which is one of the organizations we help with refugees. Because they suffer also from violence and... They escape, yeah. It's families that escape. Mm -hmm. So, you started uh, the Isabel Allende Foundation in honor of your daughter Paula, but the mission is to support and empower women and Im immigrants, both legal and illegal. And um, tell us Why you support only women and how? Because every penny that you invest in women is multiplied. Women uh, who are empowered, who have a little money, a little ed education, they struggle for their families and they bring the family out of extreme poverty. The same money invested in a man doesn't have the same effect. Mm -hmm. And it is women who can change the world. They change the family, they change the community. Tell us how you support the women, what do you offer? We offer help to organizations and programs that already exist. We don't invent anything. And it is, it is a financial help in the areas of education, and that means also giving someone a skill. It doesn't have to be proper college. It has to be just enough so that they can make a living. Health. And health, health is essential for a woman. And that includes, of course, planning your family and having control of your body. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't control your body, you don't control anything. Mm -hmm. And protection from violence and exploitation. Because a woman that lives in fear is a woman trapped forever. And your daughter-in-law, Lori, Lori Barra, runs the Allende Foundation. Mm -hmm. And you dedicate your latest novel, The Wind Knows My Name, The Wind Can't My Name, to her. Why? Because she is the one who got me in touch with all these programs that help refugees in the border. So I was able to do all the research for that book because of Lori, because I could get in touch with all those people. It was during the pandemic. So my, much of that was on Zoom. And when the pandemic ended, I could meet them personally. Mm -hmm. But I knew about the case of Anita. In real life, the girl is called Juliana because of, of, of Lori. And you met her through the organization? Yes, mm -hmm. the Florence Project. We will come back later to Anita. So I would like to talk now about your novel, The Wind Knows My Name. It is a fascinating story intertwining past and present. It follows the boy Samuel Adler, who escapes Nazi-occupied Vienna in 1938, and the girl Anita Diaz, who flees El Salvador with her mother in 2019. How did the story emerge, and why did you bind these overarching topics of escape and immigration together? Because 
I heard the, the story of a little girl called Juliana who escaped from El Salvador from, uh, the mother was even wounded. She, someone had shot her and they crossed illegally into the United States and the, they were separated. And uh, the mother was sent into some detention center and moved around to the point that they lost track of her. And the girl ended up in a shelter. And then she was um, in, in foster homes. This is a blind girl that doesn't speak the language, that doesn't know where she is, that she has lost touch with her grandmother who raised her. She, she's absolutely terrified in a foreign land and separated from the mother. She becomes a number in the bureaucracy of immigration. So she even doesn't have a name. Well, everybody's given a, f a number and a file. I mean, they open a file for each case. So the girl is a number. The title of your book? Comes from there. Because the girl says, at least the wind knows my name. So somebody knows where I am. Somebody knows who I am. And, and someday I will see my mother again. Now, the story of Juliana in real life did not end well. In my book, it ends well because, because of Samuel. Now, why did I do the arch all the way back 80 years to Vienna? Because this horrible situation of separating the parents from the children, sometimes by force, as it happened here in the border, but sometimes the parents have to make the horrible choice of letting go of the children to save their lives. And this is happening in Ukraine today, it's happening in Gaza, it's happening in many places where parents, to save their children, send them away. And they don't know even who is going to take care of them if someone is going to take care of them. But they need to save the children. Thousands and thousands of minors come to the United States, some of them little children, because the parents cannot keep them safe in their own countries. So I... I jumped far into the past to another continent, another culture, other race, other people in another language to see that we are all similar mm -hmm. and that, that history repeats itself. The horror things happen over and over. And it is not less painful for a mother in El Salvador than it was for Samuel's mother in Vienna. Yeah, no. It is the same pain. And why did you choose Vienna? I mean, the kinder transporter, uh, they are really very known, well known in Germany. as uh, They happened in Germany as well. And why did you choose? I, I heard on TV an interview to one of the survivors of the kinder transport. And that person was from Vienna. And I thought, oh. why? it's too, too cliche to make it from Germany. You know? And how did uh, Samuel emerge, the character? I mean, is it is his character as well based on a real case? No. No. But I needed to, to create a character that was a, a person who changes dramatically in the book. This is a, a child that has one talent, he, the music. Music saves him. And this child who is traumatized grows up to be a very guarded, protected person who doesn't want to take risk. He wants to be in the orchestra. He wants music. He wants a safe place. Mm -hmm. And then he meets Nadine, who is a crazy, wonderful, exuberant woman. She represents everything that he is not, mm -hmm. everything that he will never be. But he's fascinated. And so he marries this woman. And he witnesses her life, but never participates in what she does. He, he can only look at her and, and admire her life, but he cannot take any risks. And so when finally he's trapped in his house in, in the midst of the pandemic and has time to reflect, he cannot play in the orchestra, he cannot see his friends for the quartet that they play, he cannot teach, he cannot do anything, he's stuck there. He, and in this time of reflection, he realizes that he has not lived. Mm -hmm. He spent his whole life avoiding life. And that he says, I, my worst sin is the sin of indifference, he says. That, that he, to, in order to be safe, he was indifferent. Mm -hmm. And then when life gives him the opportunity to atone for that sin, when, when Anita 
comes into his life, he opens for the first time his heart, his home, his life. To this young... Yeah. And he changes. Guy. And yeah. to me, the, the story is about, it's always about change. Yeah. Uh, Something happens that makes people change. Yeah. And that's the story. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to give too much away, but you already said uh, it, Samuel, as an old man, meets Anita and she finds a new home in his house in Berkeley. And But I would like to come back to your really, when you describe in your book and you tell the story of migrants, when they cross the border, they are treated like animals, I quote you. And I would like to talk with you, what about the inhumanity of separating families when they are in the process of immigration? And how does this inhumanity play out for Anita and her mother Marisol? What happens? Please tell well, well, our what, listeners. What happens to them is what I just t told you, that they, they, the mother is sent away to a detention centers. They are really prisons. And in Texas and in other places, while the girl is sent to a shelter. And uh, in the shelter, she's supposed to stay not more than a month or two. But because uh, they can't find any um, relative or anybody who knows the girl, she's sent to foster homes. And the experience in foster homes can be relatively good or it can be horrible. And there are many cases of abuse, of, of even sexual harassment of kids. And there are kids who have died in this process. So it is incredibly hard. And, and as a mother, I thought a lot about this. Would I separate from my children to keep them safe? Mm -hmm. And it, that's a question that I cannot answer. Because I've asked also Nico, for example, about his children. And he can't answer it either. You have to find yourself in that situation in order to, to make the choice. Because in abstract, I would say, no, I will never do it. So under Trump's zero tolerance policy, it happened really. Thousands of kids were separated. And there are still, the many of them have not been able to reunite with their families still. Still. So it is obviously meant to discourage people from coming. And in your novel, the lawyer Frank supports the organization which helps refugee children. And he says, they know we take their children away. Why are they still coming? How would you answer this question? Well, they come because they're desperate. Because they, then you don't have a choice. You have to get out. In the case of Marisol, she had been shot. Uh, and she knows that she will be killed. If she, if she stays, she will be killed. And so she, she leaves because there's no choice. In the case of Leticia, the, the maid in the house who has left many years before, they massacred all her village yeah. in El Mosote. But El Mosote is one of those events in which the military go into a village and they kill even the pets, even the dogs, the hens, everybody. They burn alive the children in the, in the church, inside the church. And this, this happened not so, not so long ago. And so the only two people who survive in the village is the father with the girl because they were not there. Right. And they have to get out. So it, it, when the circumstances are so tragic, when the violence is so rampant that you cannot live in your place, you have to get out. So walls uh, don't help. I think that the only solution, because this is the, the, the problem of refugees is increasing. And the topic of refugees is a global problem a global and a problem. burning issue also in Europe. And it divides societies. I mean, your character, Frank, expresses a worry which many people share in pointing out we can take in millions of immigrants and refugees. What do you think needs to happen to solve this? I think we need global agreements. The whole world needs to get involved in this. The problems need to be solved in the countries of origin. If you have a situation like you have today in Haiti, for example, which is a country taken by gangs completely, of course people will get out. And if that is not solved there, They get out. 
Venezuela was a country that received millions of immigrants from all over the world, and I was one of them. Now six million Venezuelans got out. The country has not changed. It is still a rich country. The government changed. So when the government changes, when there is a collapsed government, when, 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 when the country is taken over by, by criminals, people have to run away. So, and now we come to the U.S. Trump is candidate of the Republican Party now, and he could become the next American president again. He already said in his campaign that he will conduct a massive deportation of immigrants and other things. How do you view him? I view him like a criminal, first of all. I think he, he's pro a proven felon. And uh, it, it's too bad that he represents so many people in this country because he's not alone, standing alone. He has not created anything. He just represents what is there. When he says that immigrants are not people, and that he will deport them, he's speaking for those who think that way and do not say it aloud, but he represents them. And that is, I think, between 30 and 40 percent of the population, which is not only in the United States, everywhere. You go in every place in the United in, in, in Europe or in Latin America, and you will find a percentage of the population that thinks that way. And so we have been lucky enough that we have institutions and laws and a sense of civility that has prevented these people from taking over. But when they do, there you have a regime like the Nazis had in, in, in Germany, like Mussolini had in Italy, like Pinochet had in Chile. When they take over, then it's very hard to get rid of them. Because they can uh, change the laws or they try. Of course, and they can stay in power because, because they, they do it by brute force. But, it, but, but it, they don't act alone. They, there's massive amount of people who is willing to follow that path. And, and in normal times in this country, for example, there are words that you don't say because it's so politically incorrect. You refer to people of color with certain terms, but everybody knows what the real word is and they don't say it unless someone like Trump comes in a rally and says it, and then everybody feels that they are allowed mm. to express what they feel. So I know writers who say we will immigrate if... Yes, I, mean, I, I said that when Trump was elected the first time, and I did not emigrate, I stayed. And I will probably stay again, because it's very hard, as I said before, to leave everything that you have everything that is familiar to you. Where would I go? To the south of Chile, probably. Mm -hmm. That would be my place. Mm -hmm. Can I take Roger, who doesn't speak a word of Spanish, who is far away from his children and his grandchildren? Would, be, would I be separated from, from Nico mm -hmm. and Lori? No. And though your novel shows, I mean, it is a story of hope, I think, while searching for family and home, You focus on the people who are helping. Yes, because we all know about the horrors that happen, the abuse, the, the trafficking, the crime, the, the rapes. We all hear about that constantly. We never hear about the people who help, the organizations and the people who help. And that's what I know. I know them well because I work with them. So I find social work, they're all women, by the way. Yeah? Most of them are women. Like the woman, Selena, yeah, in your they are novel. Yeah, so, they're social workers, they're psychologists, they're, uh, the pro bono lawyers. 40,000 American lawyers represent immigrant children pro bono in the courts. 99% are women, because there's no glory and no money in it. <laughs> there's no glory and no money in it, yeah. So, Anita, Your protagonist escapes her brutal reality and separation from her mother by creating an imaginary world, which she calls Azabahar. And in which way is imagination important to her and how does it help her to survive? Well, one of the many symptoms of trauma in children, especially younger children, is they they uh, go back in age, for example, let's say that they come, 
a six-year-old starts behaving like a four-year-old or a three-year-old. Many of them go back to using diapers because they can't control bowels. Often they don't speak or they don't want to eat. And another thing is they invent a friend, an imaginary friend or an imaginary place where they can escape, where they can feel safe because everything around them is shifting constantly. So they need in their, in their imagination a place or a person that is constant, that gives them some safety. And it's also a metaphor for writing. I mean, for your, you, I mean, you are the master of imagination. That's what they say. Exactly. <laughs> Nicolas would say she's a liar. <laughs> <laughs> So now we come to the end of our talk with the anecdote called Fiction and Truth. Isabel, please start with your anecdote. Well, I have been in love with Antonio Banderas all my life. Well, for as long as he has been alive, I'm much older than him. Uh, I met him many, many years ago uh, for different reasons. And um, because he was in the movie of The House of the Spirits, I met him that first time. Many years later, in 1991, in December, I was introducing my book, presenting my book, The Infinite Plan, in Barcelona in a beautiful Gaudi building. And there was this party, and I was on stage with Antonio Banderas, a microphone and a glass of champagne. And the crowd was down there, and everybody was celebrating the, Antonio Banderas mostly. And, um, and then I saw my agent that, was, that came crossing the, the crowd, came to me and she said that Paula was, was ill, very ill in the hospital in Madrid. Your daughter Paula. My daughter yes. Paula. So I gave a glass of champagne to Antonio and, and just left for the airport to go to run to Madrid to see my daughter. And um, many years later I saw again Antonio for the opening of um, a Zorro movie. And he just as handsome and charming as ever. And I think he looked even better. He was more mature, I would say. But of course, I was much older too. So I proposed a date with him <laughs> and I invited him out. And what happened that night, I cannot tell. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Isabel. It was a pleasure having you. Well, thank you for coming all the way from Germany just to speak with me. Thank you very much. Liebe Zuhörerinnen und Zuhörer, das war das Gespräch zwischen Isabel Allende und Christiane von Korf. Auch dieses Mal gab es ja eine Anekdote, die Isabel Allende noch Christiane von Korf erzählt hat. Und ihr, liebe Zuhörerinnen und Zuhörer, müsst wie immer raten, ob die Anekdote wahr ist oder erfunden. Wenn ihr es wisst, dann schickt uns bitte eine E-Mail an podcast.surkamp.de und schreibt, was ihr glaubt, Wahrheit oder Dichtung. Bitte denkt dran, in die Betreffzeile der E-Mail zu schreiben, auf welche Folge ihr euch bezieht. Unter den richtigen Antworten verlosen wir drei Exemplare von Der Wind kennt meinen Namen, dem neuen Roman von Isabel Allende. Hier noch der Hinweis, dass wir in den Shownotes wie immer einige Buchtipps auflisten, die zu Der Wind kennt meinen Namen von Isabel Allende passen. Ich bedanke mich bei Isabel Allende und Christiane von Korf für dieses Gespräch und wie immer ist es nett, wenn ihr den Podcast abonniert und uns eine Bewertung dalasst. Viele Grüße und Tschüss. Dichtung und Wahrheit ist ein Podcast der Verlage Surkamp und Insel, produziert von Bosepark Productions.